Welcome, my name is Brian Havel. I'm director of the International Aviation Law Institute at DePaul University College of Law in Chicago. This is the fifth event in the Institute's oral history series, Conversations with Aviation Leaders, in which we explore the origins, history, and record of US airline deregulation, both domestic and international, with academics, officials, political figures, and industry leaders who've played a significant role in this extraordinary public policy experiment and in its aftermath. Our format today, as in the past, will be three one-hour sessions constructed around the career experiences of our guest. And today we're delighted to have with us the former governor of Virginia and the chairman of President Bill Clinton's National Commission to ensure a strong competitive airline industry, the Honorable Gerald L. Belisles. Part one of the interview will focus on the commission and domestic reforms. Part two will look at regulation and deregulation, re-regulation. And part three will consider international deregulation under the banner of open skies. At least that's how we plan the interview in theory. It's really up to our distinguished interlocutor and to Governor Belas himself as to how today's conversation will unfold. Our interlocutor is Greg Zapato, <coughs> who was executive director of the National Commission to ensure a strong competitive airline industry and who is now president of Airports Council International North America. Let me take a few minutes to introduce Governor Belisles and Mr. Principato in a little more detail. President Clinton tapped Jerry Belisles for the leadership of the National Commission because he had served as 65th Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia from 1986 to 1990 and was Virginia's advocate in chief for improved trade relationships, not just in aviation, and leading in his tenure to a situation where exported products accounted for as much as 25% of the state's economic growth, three times as much as the United States as a whole. I owe a special debt to Governor Belisles and the report of his commission. The report with its massive documentary database became the basis for my first book on international aviation liberalization published 15 years ago. Indeed, I'm clutching here this morning my beloved, well-thumbed copy of the actual 1993 report, which was published in an interesting size for a government report. This is a shade smaller than the tabloid format used by many newspapers, but I've never seen it used for an official government document. Perhaps the governor will explain that decision when he's talking with Mr. <laughs> Principato this morning. And by the way, despite what looks like a very fancy publication, one third of the commission's budget was returned to the US Treasury. And I should also say that the report was delivered two days before the expiration of its very compressed 90-day deadline. 18 years later, Governor Belisles today is director and CEO of the Miller Center of Public Affairs based at the University of Virginia. It's a nonpartisan institute that seeks to expand understanding of the presidency, of policy, and political history, providing critical insights for the nation's governance challenges and promoting bipartisan discourse and consensus to the extent that uh, such a Sisyphean task is still possible in the current political environment. The Miller Center and Governor Belisles are also celebrated for bridging the gap between academics and government, an effort that we at the International Aviation Law Institute are seeking to emulate with events of this kind. And the Miller Center is well versed in the kind of oral history we are doing today, conducting projects including transcription and editing of Oval Office tapes uh, going back to the Roosevelt era. I also recommend to you the proceedings of the Miller Center's September 2009 National Transportation Policy Conference published under the title, Well Within Reach, America's New Transportation Agenda. Governor Belisles convened this conference to examine how best to use the powers of the federal and state governments to tackle what the report calls, and I quote, crowded airports, crowded airplanes, screeching airplanes, and archaic equipment, unquote. Governor Belisles was formerly a partner at <coughs> Hunton and Williams in Richmond, Virginia, where he headed, as you would expect, the firm's international team. He is a JD from the University of Virginia and holds 11 honorary degrees from colleges and universities across the nation. His tenure as governor of Virginia is looked upon now as a golden era for the state. I quote from the Richmond Times Dispatch of July 4th, 1999. Please feel free to Google it at your leisure. And his state continues to look fondly on its former governor. In 2009, he was named Virginian of the Year by the Virginia Press Association. 
for the, quote, great leadership he has given to the state for each role in which he has served, unquote. And recently, the Virginia Bar Association changed the name of its prestigious Distinguished Service Award to the Gerald L. Belisles Distinguished Service Award. And a final note of interest for our institute, Governor Belisles is the co-founder of our journal, Issues in Aviation Law and Policy, IALP, which has just celebrated its 10th anniversary. And the other co-founder, Stephen B. Rudolph, now serves as the managing editor of IALP and is the Institute's executive director and organizer of today's event. Congratulations on your many achievements, Governor, and on your unyielding commitment to public service, and welcome to, to Chicago and to DePaul. Our interlocutor today, as I mentioned, is Greg Principato, who since 2005 has been president of Airports Council International North America, the largest of the five worldwide regions of Airports Council International and the leading association of airports and airport-related businesses in North America. Mr. Principato was previously executive director of the aforesaid National Commission to ensure a strong competitive airline industry and has a 25-year public policy career in aviation and transportation infrastructure that includes working on these issues for U.S. Senators J. Bennett Johnson and Joseph Orr Biden, and then for the Belisles administration, where he collaborated with Congress on the transfer of Reagan National and Washington Dulles airports from federal control to the control of the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. Accordingly, it is fair to say that he is not meeting Governor Belisles for the first time today. <laughs> Mr. Principato is now one of the most prominent policy leaders in the U.S. air transport industry and beyond U.S. borders. And there's a very long list of aviation issues that he has stewarded in his various professional incarnations, including the convening of the <coughs> Coalition for a Global Standard on Aviation Noise. We are delighted to welcome him for the first time in person to the Institute, even though he has been very supportive over the years as a member of our advisory board. Mr. Principato is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and earned an MA in International Relations from the University of Chicago. Greg, thank you for working with the Institute to prepare today's conversation, sure. and it is my pleasure to hand the first session over to you. Brian, thank you very much. It's great to be here at uh, this Notre Dame graduate, to be here at DePaul University, um, a real pleasure. Um, let me just say a couple of things before we get started. In, it, it really is a, um, an honor to be part of this distinguished series, and as I look at the people who have been interviewed in this series before, most of them have spent every waking moment of their careers working on aviation matters, Bob Crandall and, and, and people like that, Mike Levine, other, others like that. Um, Jerry Belisles is a little bit different from that. Um, as Brian's already said, was governor of Virginia from 1986 to 1990, and was attorney general and a state legislator before that, a lawyer um, before his political career and after. and. Um, you might wonder, well, there are a lot of governors, there are a lot of lawyers, why, why this guy? And we'll get into a little bit of that as we go through the next few hours of the interview. But suffice to say that the way Governor Belisles combined his support for improving the transportation infrastructure with an economic growth and competitiveness strategy in Virginia was so uh, impressive to his colleagues around the country, the other 49 governors, that as a first-term governor, he was elected chairman of the National Governors Association which is a very rare feat indeed. You can go back and look that up. You can Google that as well. It uh, doesn't happen very often, and his, his colleagues were, uh, were uh, most impressed by that. But we're really here to talk about the commission, and we're going to get into a lot of detail. One of the lessons the governor has always taught me is don't step on your own story, so I won't talk too much about the commission. Uh, but Brian's already referred to the fact that it was delivered on time, <coughs> excuse me, and under budget a rarity indeed in Washington in 1993, and it never happens anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think the, the three things that the commission did that we want to really get into these next few hours is the commission really, I think, settled the debate over deregulation versus re-regulation. And we want to get into that. It was an open question on May 24th, 1993, when the commission started. It was not an open question any longer on August 19th, 1993, when we ended. Uh, it set air traffic control up as an issue for public discussion and debate before it had been seen as an inside, uh, inside the industry <coughs> issue. And I think the Commission made valuable contributions there. And it really ratified the liberalization and open skies approach that had begun under the first Bush administration. 
I think those are three really important things to keep in mind when looking at the Commission as a watershed event. So with that as a little bit of context, Governor, let's get started. Okay. And um, we're going to talk about the Commission over these next couple of hours and, and various aviation issues, but let's go back prior to that. Um, mentions already been made of your work as Governor and in state government uh, before you became the Commission Chair. Talk a little bit about how you became interested in these issues and uh, what drove you to place them at such a high uh, place on your gubernatorial agenda. The uh, 19th century English poet William Wordsworth is famous for a line in one of his poems, the child is the father of the man. And that's perhaps true here because as a child I was always fascinated with flight. Um, why do things fly? And as a student of history and geography, I was fascinated with, as a child with, um, with airplanes and airports. Uh, I had uncles who had been in World War II. They brought back their Air Force manuals. I memorized the cockpits, the profiles of the planes. So there was an early um, fascination with how did the Wright brothers figure out how things fly? And what I remember and I hope I still remember this correctly, that the Wright brothers mastered three principles. One was lift, second was thrust, and the third was control. Now they, they may not have been the exact terms, but those were the concepts. And I guess I've been uh, fascinated with the flight ever since. Um, as a, and, and I'm also, as a student of history, aware that a lot of flight uh, progress was made in Virginia. Uh, General Billy Mitchell in 1919 showed in the Chesapeake Bay that airplanes could sink a ship uh, after World War I. Um, the uh, Langley Air Force, or the Langley uh, Aviation Testing Center in, in uh, Virginia, I think more than half of the aircraft flying in the world have been tested using the technology in the wind tunnels uh, at Langley. Uh, long before uh, the government had a commercial um, and, and governmental flight program, space program, uh, on the eastern shore of Virginia at Wallops Island, uh, flights or, or pil uh, uh, rockets were being tested uh, for uh, suborbital flight. So when, when you look at all of that, <clears throat> and then as a young legislator, I was involved in a bitter battle over whether the Commonwealth should agree to the uh, inaugural flights of the Concord landing at Washington Dulles Airport, which is located in Northern Virginia. Um, so I was an advocate of um, the Concord and technology and progress and speed. Um, as Attorney General, I represented the um, Department of Aviation, obviously, along with other agencies and institutions of state government. And then as Governor, I uh, was acutely aware that a lot of small rural communities that were hoping for economic development growth were denied growth because of the inadequate general aviation airports. Um, and I uh, made a point that when we, my first week in office, when we rolled out um, the largest tax increase in Virginia history for transportation, I ensured that aviation was included as a part of um, the funding streams being di directed to <coughs> airport development, uh, improved air service, uh, and then um, I guess uh, also, during that term in office, I was determined to bring uh, international air flights to Washington Dulles and was very much involved in negotiating from Europe the uh, inaugural flight of Lufthansa into uh, the Washington area, and then from the Pacific region, uh, ANA, all Nippon Airways, uh, and e even persuaded them to uh, serve Virginia Wines on those uh, flights uh, for several years. So. <laughs> I've been looking for um, commercial opportunities, economic growth, and transportation is very much a part of that. I mean, my view is that uh, the purpose of transportation is to move people and products 
from one place to another. Uh, if, if one cannot do that, one cannot compete in today's global economy. And if you can't compete, you can't grow. I think it's that fundamental. So uh, when I became chairman of the National Governors Association, uh, I persuaded my colleagues uh, to include in a overarching view of the global economy and the state's role in that economy and what states had to do to prepare for that economy. All of this occurring at the time that the European Union was really going to a common market. There were discussions of the euro and a lot of other things that the states had to be prepared to deal with that uh, reality. And the result was that transportation had to be a very critical part of any economic growth strategy and that commercial aviation, general aviation, were important components of that strategy. So from childhood to adulthood, I guess flight has been very much a, a conscious part of my thinking. You, you raise an interesting uh, point there before we get to the commission, but you raise an interesting point. Oftentimes these issues get uh, mixed up politically in terms of whether they're pork barrel projects or just to create short-term jobs. I'm talking about infrastructure projects, but you were able to put it into a, in, into a bigger context. Do you have any advice for uh, today's leaders in terms of how they might, uh, they might successfully do that? Well, it, it is currently popular for many people in public life, uh, perhaps others, uh, to talk about government spending. Um, and when government spends money, it spends money. But to me, there is a distinction between investing and consuming. And that's a distinction I think we've lost in our society. Uh, to me, long-term capital projects that are going to be built over time, financed over time, should be considered as investments. And with with the approach of persuading uh, Virginians to invest in highways and rail and seaports and airports and air service, um, I think we were able to persuade people that this was something that was critical for Virginia's future. Things were good, but if you wanted to maintain that, if you wanted to improve that kind of progress, then we had to do it. And we had goals. I mean, for example, in education, we said our goal in the four years is to have faculty salaries tops in all the southeastern states and in the top ten of the country. Uh, four years later that goal had been reached. Uh, but the point was that for us to do that we had to have the revenues. To get the revenues you have to have a thriving economy. Transportation is a part of that economic growth pattern. So with that sort of explanation constantly being made in all speeches, all appearances. You were able to get buy-in from the education community, faculty, deans, directors, others, understood the big picture and the important role that they played in advancing economic growth opportunities. And the transportation was a part of it. And if we had to raise revenues to finance transportation needs, they were supported. The result was, um, the largest increase in, in the last time there's been an increase in revenues for Virginia was 1986, my first year, first week in office. I always thought it was interesting at the time, this was during the middle of the Reagan Revolution, when supposedly oh, yeah. taxes were a, bad, uh, were a bad thing. Well, President Reagan raised taxes hmm. six, seven, eight times. I mean, he gets a lot of credit for reducing taxes, but uh, he raised the gas tax, for example, at the federal level because someone said, we've got to do this for the national transportation picture, and he said, you're right. So he did it. Yeah, I've always thought he didn't get the credit he deserved for being a practical politician, <laughs> not just a principled one. You can be both, right? Well, I, I would <laughs> say that he and I were, although of different parties, were never politicians. We used to run against him. <laughs> Heard that line before. <laughs> Let's talk about the National Commission to ensure a strong competitive airline industry. People may not remember at the time, the it was a really huge deal. You had airlines going out of business and those kind of things, a lot of people losing their jobs. And the impaneling of this commission was a big story. Uh, most of the meetings ended up being televised on C-SPAN in the end. And the, the question of who was going to chair it was very much uh, an open and interesting <coughs> question. How did, how, how did President Clinton um, come to ask you to do that? Um, 
There's a little bit of a story there. In uh, February, I believe, February 1993, I was the luncheon speaker at the Aero Club in Washington. And the topic assigned to me was the impact of, of air service on the economies of the, of the globe. And I, uh, I guess I made this impassioned plea about the importance of investing in transportation and particularly airports and air service. Um, in the audience was a former colleague and a very good friend of mine, uh, Jim Blanchett, former governor of Michigan and later ambassador to Canada uh, under, in the Clinton administration. He was in the audience, heard the speech. What I did not know at the time was that his wife, Janet, was working in the White House when Congress and the White House were discussing the creation of a National Airline Commission. Sometime later, um, I guess the question arose, uh, who should be chair of this commission? Uh, Blanchard recommended uh, me to the president. Uh, the president and I were good friends. We had worked together uh, in national governor's meetings. And he was, um, I think, interested uh, in my background and interest in aviation. And the result was he, uh, he called. Before I accepted, though, I spent the weekend uh, reading transcripts of committee hearings and the discussion of congressional committees. Uh, about the need for the commission. I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to get a sense of just how clearly committed members of Congress were uh, to the concept of a creation of a commission and whether they were really interested in doing this for cosmetic reasons or whether they were deeply committed to the idea that the country needed to address these serious questions. Well, it's an interesting point, the last one, because what people probably don't remember is that the commission was created by an act of Congress. And um, I think in the, in the commission report, um, the, the act of Congress that was passed is in there. And um, so you know, there was a very clear um, interest in doing this. And obviously, the president was on board. He signed it. Uh, I know you went to meet with him uh, in the Oval Office before you started. Maybe you can shed a little bit of light on the conversation you had with him and the sense that you had coming out of that meeting and going into the chairmanship. Um, I think it it was clear that he was committed to this. Um, the country really was concerned about this. In 1993, in the previous three or four years, the airlines collectively had lost more money than, they, than the industry had ever made since the advent of flight. So um, the Wright brothers could have used profitability as a fourth principle. They maybe could they have. Should have. Yeah. Should have. Should have. Um, but the uh, there were three major carriers, as I recall, that had um, gone under, Pan Am, uh, Eastern, and Braniff. Um, McDonnell Douglas uh, was on the verge of going under and would, later was absorbed by Boeing. Uh, aerospace manufacturers were laying off thousands and thousands and thousands of skilled workers, highly paid workers. Um, all of this was occurring during the time of a recession, and I think people were rightly worried about it. Um, whether they were more worried about the immediate short-term concerns as opposed to the long-term uh, big picture uh, is a question that we may never know uh, the answer to that. But I think the President clearly understood that something needed to be done, and, you know, governors um, uh, as, as a group, uh, understand that when you have a problem, you have to deal with it. Um, you don't have the luxury of perhaps letting things um, mature over time, but he was clearly interested in this. We had talked about transportation issues at national governor's meetings, uh, so I think he was very much in favor of this idea, and I agreed to serve. You, know, you talked a little bit about the industry conditions in terms of the layoffs and the companies that went out of business. I think it's also instructive to look back on you know, the overall economic conditions at the time, you know, uh, the, the shape of the economy and, and fuel and some other things like that. Yeah, you know, during this period you had the, the, the Gulf War and the aftermath of that. You had uh, huge 
spikes in the price of oil. Um, there were incidents of terrorism. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, and, and security concerns uh, that permeated not just the industry, but I think members of Congress and the public as, as a general uh, thing. So I, uh, I think the conditions um, really demanded the creation of a commission. And as you know, in the history of our country, if there is a problem and you don't know what to do with it, you form a commission. Um, <laughs> there's a study group. And if you don't like that one, then you form another one. But I think the time, the times demanded uh, the creation of this. And I think you were right. There was a lot of interest in this. Um, the, uh, the press coverage uh, at these meetings uh, that we conducted over the life of the commission, um, I think was constant. Um, it was, um, and it was a nice way to get the story out because the live coverage of these uh, hearings, I think, that we conducted, the deliberations, um, and, and the fact that the chemistry of our group um, worked. I mean, I think the public sensed that. And we had, I think, 11 ex officio members of Congress. Uh, and I think they, uh, they saw that the creation of the commission was a good thing, and they were supportive of the president. You mentioned, you mentioned Congress, uh, you know, they did pass a law creating the commission. They had a lot of uh, directives that they gave the commission. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to see the long list of things they wanted done in 90 days? Yeah, um, as I said, you know, when I, when I uh, was first considering uh, chairing the commission, and even later, I went back and read not only the legislation that created the commission, but the hearings that preceded the commission's formation. I was um, struck by what was expected. Now remember, they wanted, they wanted a body of experts in the fields of aviation finance and economics and transportation and other factors. And they wanted, it, they wanted us to investigate, study, and to make recommendations uh, about the financial health of the aviation industry. Uh, and to make practical uh, recommendations, all in 90 days. I mean, just the logistics of trying to pull uh, 15 people plus 11 members of Congress together and to then make the contacts with the industry and the experts and the academics and others to participate was uh, really a Herculean challenge. Um, I'm sure we're familiar with uh, the late night show, David Letterman's top 10 list. Um, the things that Congress put into this legislation, uh, if you were to take this to David Letterman <laughs> for his top 10, it would have taken him weeks just to go through the things that Congress had uh, requested that we study. And I have a, a list somewhere here of uh, of the list of issues, but the, the list of issues, the point is that the list of issues um, was high and the demands, I thought, were somewhat imposing. Um, but I seem to remember some people in Congress even said you can get more time if you want, and you, and you turn that down. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, some members of our commission at the very first meeting said we need more time. And I remember saying, no, we know what the problems are. We just have to focus on recommendations. Um, we're going to do this report, and we're going to do it on time, and we're going to do it on, under budget. And so, as you mentioned earlier, um, we did it two days early, and we returned some money back to the Treasury. But it was, um, it was a fascinating exercise, um, and in many respects, a lot easier to deal with these different experts from different fields across the country than dealing with um, a legislative body. <laughs> well, you know, the, um, the commission was put together um, because there was an industry writ large, the aviation industry, but the airlines, the manufacturers, airports, and others who were having a, um, having a tough time having to lay people off. That's already been described. Um, was the industry welcoming of the commission and of the effort? Um, 
the ATA, the Air Transport Association's media representative, was quoted sometime shortly after the um, commission was announced that the average ticket agent possessed more knowledge and experience than the members of the commission. Um, other than that, um, I think uh, the industry uh, was, um, was generally supportive. I, in fact, um, I've received a number of calls from uh, members of the uh, industry asking good questions, offering assistance, um, volunteering to make themselves and others available uh, for whatever purpose we need. But I will say that, um, that while the industry was generally supportive, there were others who I think had some questions. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, did an editorial that I thought might be uh, interesting. They, uh, they, they worried that uh, the commission would recommend uh, closing the U.S. market to foreign carriers um, and that we would recommend reviving the Civil Air and Aeronautics Board, in other words, go back to the days of regulation. Uh, others wondered whether, um, because we had so many representatives from key manufacturing states, uh, that we would recommend opening up the Treasury so that airlines could buy more planes from those states that manufactured uh, planes. Uh, they worried that we would uh, uh, propose a number of tax credits and loan guarantees. Um, I remember specifically uh, being puzzled about uh, one statement that someone made in the press that they doubted we would take the long-term view. Uh, they uh, doubted whether we would recommend um, the uh, establishment of an air traffic control corporation or somehow get it out of the daily vicissitudes of government. They worried whether we would offer an expansionist policy for um, international air service negotiations. Um, since uh, Greg represents airports, I might say that one uh, one great fear expressed by some writer was that an airport lobbyist had been uh, appointed to fight for airport interest uh, in front of the commission. But in the end, I think uh, we surprised them all. I think we, uh, the airline commission, rose above those fears and concerns. And we had nothing, I think, but great cooperation from the industry itself. I remember that editorial very well. I remember your reaction to it. And I remember when the commission ended, we went up to meet with their editorial board. And I also remember they didn't write, a, um, they didn't write another editorial saying that they were wrong. <laughs> just, a, just an editorial well, comment. Well, as H.L. Lincoln mind. once said um, when he wrote uh, many years ago, you never get in a quarrel with someone who buys ink by the barrel. Right. Um, right. So. That's right. Well, one, one criticism of the commission going in and, may, and maybe after um, certainly from um, at least one of the commissioners, was um, whether the commission would adequately weigh the effects of, um, of its recommendations on consumers and on, uh, on employees. And uh, so I, I seem to remember that uh, the different categories of people who are on the commission, you fit into the consumer category You're as an airline passenger. I think that's where they uh, put you in. There were slots for the others. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, um, about that and how concerned the Commission was about those issues? Well, you know, the purpose of transportation is to move people and products um, and to provide services. Um, so clearly we had to be concerned about the impact of any recommendations or any significant changes in the industry on, uh, on the consuming public. We did have uh, uh, employee and consumer representatives on the Commission. Uh, I was never quite sure what my category was, but <laughs> I do recall we had two labor representatives, mm -hmm. and we had others who represented consumers, and we had a lot of people representing consumer organizations in the audience uh, during our deliberations. Uh, so we scheduled one of our major uh, sessions uh, on the impact of uh, general aviation or aviation conditions on the general public. Uh, that may have surprised people, but 
um, I thought it was critical that we do that. What, let's, um, let's, get, let's get into the report card part of this a little bit. Um, successes, failures, and so forth. Let's start with successes. Where do you think the commission was most successful? Um, well, we, uh, someone did a check. I never counted to be sure that the number was correct, but someone said that we had 60 or 61. I think the number was 61 specific recommendations. And after the report was issued and the Clinton administration drew up its aviation initiative, 49 of our 61 recommendations were included in the administration's package. Uh, so I thought that, you know, in baseball, that's a pretty good uh, batting average. Um, and, and yet someone said, well, what happened to the other 12? <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we couldn't get them all. But frankly, uh, I think we made uh, a very conscious effort to step back from the headlines. And so for me, uh, the major success was trying to focus on the big picture rather than specific interest. And you talk about the role of air transportation uh, in a modern economy. And I think we tried to frame our deliberations, our discussions, our recommendations uh, in terms of what's the best way to move people and products from one destination to another uh, and the recommendations, however many there were, really fell into three categories. One was uh, efficiency and technological superiority. Uh, and that embraced a number of our specific recommendations. But in, in three general concepts, that the air transportation has to have, must possess at all times efficient uh, and superior uh, technological superiority. Second, uh, financial strength. A number of our recommendations fell into that functional category. And three, we stressed highly the critical nature of access to global markets because we felt, and I still do, that that's where the growth is. So, you know, by forcing specific interest into three broad areas, it I think it helped change the terms of discussion, the way people and policymakers look at the industry. You've got to look at the broad section, uh, provide context for specific uh, and narrow interest. So, you know, I think uh, the fundamental change in the way the country looks at air service was one of our great successes. Now, if you want to get specific, um, you know, not long after um, uh, the report was out, Congress changed the bankruptcy laws uh, in significant ways that dealt with the uh, problems of the uh, industry. Uh, it passed a statute of repose on liability for general aviation manufacturers uh, that I think helped save and restore a critical part of our manufacturing uh, sector, uh, saving thousands of jobs, perhaps creating others. Uh, but there were a number of uh, recommendations like that. Uh, there were AMT reforms, which I think helped uh, airlines to some extent. Uh, but, you know, the part of the problem is that um, people don't recognize, but Greg alluded to it, is that the significant contribution of that report uh, aside from stressing international air service possibilities, was putting a nail in the coffin of the idea of re-regulation. And yeah, we're going to get into that a little bit later okay. on. A little bit later on today. Looking back, um, where do you think the commission maybe fell short? Are there are there things that you look back on and, and say, well, we we fell a little bit short there? Um, I thought we made a very compelling case uh, for improving the air traffic control system. Um, and in 1993, we recommended that within three years that the air traffic control system could and should be reformed, that GPS, uh, which hikers could use uh, on uh, mountain trails, that boaters could use in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, 
was absent in the aviation industry. We thought it made sense uh, to move in that direction and it could be achieved within three years. Here we are in 2011, 2012 around the corner and we're not there yet. Um, so I'm disappointed, not with a recommendation, but with the failure of Congress and the industry to really push. Um, I think it takes leadership. I think it requires a commitment of time and effort. Um, and you know, the, the, air, the aviation system works. It's just if you want to improve efficiency, if you want to, to um, uh, increase productivity, if you want to save time and money for both the industry and the consuming public, uh, we should have moved in this area 15 years ago. Uh, regrettably, we haven't. Um, for those who have the ability to make things happen, I would put this right up at the top of the list. I seem to remember that there were some, some ideas that came up that either the commission rejected out of hand or, or after some consideration or didn't go quite as far as maybe some of the commissioners want. If you look back, are there some things that the commission had on its plate that maybe it should either have embraced or maybe gone a little bit further on? Well, I used to joke about um, the uh, commission's failure to recommend that we do something about excessive baggage being carried on the planes. <laughs> it's a problem that still exists today. Uh, we didn't really get that, we didn't drill down that deeply um, on that kind of an issue, but um, the, uh, I, I guess looking back, we could have recommended perhaps a stronger, uh, perhaps more controversial air, air traffic control corporation that might have resulted in a compromise that would have brought us back to a, about the stage that we recommended in our report. Um, I still think for air traffic control purposes, that's the way to go to take it out of the uh, crossfire of congressional battles uh, so that the aviation system can work more effectively, more efficiently. Um, but, you know, I, on the big issues, um, I, I don't really count these as failures other than perhaps the failure to persuade the press, the public, the politicians that something ought to be done. Yeah, on the, on the um, carry-on bags, perhaps if the airlines have these big bag fees then that they have now, we might have been able to get at that. I don't know, because there are a lot more bags even being carried on. Yeah. You talked about how um, the Clinton administration took 49 of the 61 recommendations and wove them into, into their aviation policy, which as far as I know is still the, quote, official, unquote, aviation policy of the United States of America. I don't think it's been rescinded or added to uh, in the decade and a half or so since. Um, but it's one thing for the administration to embrace those recommendations, another thing for Congress to pass them all. You've just finished talking about uh, one uh, air traffic control that we'll get into a little bit more in a minute. Um, but do you think that, as you've previously stated, that um, perhaps the fact that the economy was already in recovery, even by the time the commission finished, things started to turn the corner, sort of reduced the urgency um, of, the, um, of the moment and maybe brought it back to a point where you know, in times of economic emergency, people summon up political will that they may not have in normal times uh, to do the right thing. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think after the report was issued, there was some sense of energy, some sense of interest, some sense of a commitment to move things forward. But as you say, as the economy improved and conditions were not deemed to be as dire as they had been a year or so earlier. I think the um, airlines and airports and other aviation interests retreated to their corners um, and they picked up where they had left off. Um, they fought for short-term specific interest as opposed to larger recommendations that would have um, perhaps given um, some assurance about the future. You know, uh, Mark Twain once said that history may not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> and these conditions of war and prices, price hikes and fuel, uh, 
carriers going under, being over leveraged, or whatever. These things happen uh, over time. And so, you know, what, what history tells me is that improvements in the technology of transportation demand improvements in infrastructure to accommodate those things and to permit you to be uh, more efficient and more competitive. Um, it takes a long time for some people in this country to understand that. You, you mentioned that um, as the economy improved after the uh, Commission's recommendations came out, the industry was supportive. The airlines, airports, and manufacturers were supportive. I seem to remember some meetings they all had that um, uh, that we attended, but over time they retreated back to their corners, as you say, and and I certainly see that dynamic now in Washington. I think it's a normal dynamic. How can we? Do you have any advice um, for those of us who are still in that arena, uh, who who may be perhaps accused of doing that today, um, for how to avoid that going forward? Industry going into its own corner and just fighting its own battle and not coming together for the for the common good. You know you. You can lead a horse to water, the saying goes, but you can't make a drink. Um, but I think we're required to continue our educational efforts. We live in a global society. Our economies are integrated more tightly before than ever. Um, we recognize the competitive challenges, and yet we don't recognize and are not willing to make the commitments of revenue and political will to do the things that will help us be more effective, more competitive in that new environment. Um, sometimes I think uh, it's because we have forgotten that we need to market the message. But you can't market a message if you don't know what the message is. And to me, the message must be uh, a larger contextual picture of the problems we face and then prepare the message that can persuade uh, the public and the policymakers and the press of why action is needed. Um, too often we take an issue and treat it as if it were in a vacuum unrelated to anything else um, and we don't give it the context that will help educate people who are in doubt about an issue. So for me, the, um, the challenge of our society is we're inundated with a tsunami of information. It's coming from all directions. You don't know how much of it is wisdom, how much of it is knowledge, how much of it is um, talking points uh, to push a point of view. And so it makes it very difficult for an open society to make the kinds of wise choices in a timely fashion that can serve the public interest for centuries. Um, we, we just haven't figured out how to do that. You know, you mentioned before that um, when a problem seems too tough to deal with, you form a commission. And I remember one of the things that we found um, we got a chuckle over is that Harry Truman had a commission and the Nixon and Ford administrations they had a commission that bridged the two the two administrations um, I remember you asking a question in a panel discussion not long after that whether we need another commission someday and how long it would be and I think the consensus of the industry experts on that panel was 15 years and they were only off by one because Secretary LaHood um, just had a commission that was consciously um, based on yours. Um, is, is there a magic formula out there to get a group of people together and come up with, with these ideas so we don't have to have any more commissions, we could move forward? No, I don't think we need any more commissions. I mean, we know what the problems are. What we need is political will, political courage to address those things. Um, you know, Secretary LaHood just finished up a commission. Uh, we had one 15 years earlier. Um, but if you go back in time, Harry Truman, as president in 1947, had a commission. Um, Nixon and Ford in 74 had a commission underway. Um, so, you know, I think that commissions are important, and it's important to have commissions that work together. I will tell you in this report that uh, Brian Havel referred to, um, I thought this was a good 
one reason why our commission, I thought, uh, worked well together and produced recommendations that have become a part of national policy uh, is a sentence or sentences. We spent countless hours gathering information through testimony, conversation, debate, reading, and thinking about the civil aviation industry's condition and about the importance of air transportation to the social and economic well-being of our country. The members of the commission, this is my chairman's summary uh, in the report, the members of the commission are as knowledgeable and experienced as any ever brought together to study these problems. The individual commissioners who have brought differing experiences and varying viewpoints have worked well together as a team. The chemistry has been good and the spirit constructive. And so as we went through this, we found uh, a number of things about the condition of the industry, but the benefits uh, to the consumer and to the traveling public uh, that would flow from improvements in the aviation industry. So uh, to me, we know what the problems are. Uh, we know what the solutions are. It's a question of educating the three P's, the press, the public, and the politicians. And that takes time. Uh, you've got to get their attention. And it also requires money. You know, the, this is the most global of all industries in many ways. And a lot of the issues, economic issues, environmental issues, um, safety issues, and a number of issues that um, even air traffic control that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute uh, as aircraft pass from one country to another. Um, some have suggested maybe impaneling a group of international experts to look at these things. The countries fight each other at ICAO over this or that. Try to bring an international group together. I think some people forget that at the same time as your commission was, was meeting, there was also a European version of the same commission. Maybe talk a little bit about um, how those two groups work together a little bit. And any thoughts you have on dealing with these problems um, internationally going forward, maybe, maybe bringing some people together? Well, uh, shortly after President Clinton and the Congress approved the creation of the National Airline Commission, uh, the European Union um, um, created a commission of wise men, um, as they called it. Uh, the chair was Herman de Croix. Um, I knew him, worked with him, liked him, um, and I think they had uh, similar results. They, they, uh, they worked well together. We stayed in touch uh, both before and after the uh, reports had been issued. The reports were somewhat similar in their approach to uh, uh, focusing on those three areas that I mentioned earlier about efficient and superior uh, technology. Uh, financial strength and then access to uh, uh, a more liberalized um, aviation market. Um, but I think the problems that we've been discussing uh, this morning, as well as in these two reports, <coughs> would suggest that we may not need any more commissions, whether at the regional or uh, international level, uh, unless it's designed for the purpose of finding the revenue and the political courage. Um, I would think that the, if there is to be another commission at whatever level, it really ought to focus on how do we market the message and how do we raise the revenue to meet these needs. As an aside on the uh Comité des Sages means, means um, Commission of Wise Men. I guess we can't be quite so politically incorrect I remember in the my US. French. It was pretty funny. But uh, I think one of the interesting discussions that you and Herman de Croix had was all of the, your commission meetings were not only in public, not only on C-SPAN, but literally on a stage in an auditorium. So it was as, as open as could be. And I remember um, Herman talking a little bit about how tough that would be to do in Europe. and and that their, their meetings were all, um, all behind closed doors. Well, I remember saying to him that we had no choice. Um, you know, this had been created by the White House and the Congress. Uh, it was being publicly funded. Members were appointed from the public. Uh, the meetings had to be in the public. The law required it, so that it really was not an issue. And not too long after that, I think uh, most of our members uh, soon forgot 
that it was a public meeting and they talked rather frankly, uh, collegially for the most part. Um, but it was um, something that was a little bit foreign to members of the European group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of us have had to deal with open meetings. Um, in fact, when I was a young legislator, I drafted the open meetings um, in my state, or most, much of it. So it was not an issue. Let's get into a couple of particular issues that the Commission um, uh, looked at. Um, we'll start with air traffic control. Uh, you said before, and it's been said before, that um, putting that issue front and center was not only an important thing, but it was one of the big surprises, as you put it, the Wall Street Journal expected a lot of tax breaks and all that to be recommended by the Commission, but the Commission's main recommendation was air traffic control modernization. Do you think, you know, we, we, you've already said that we're not quite there yet, and that that's a frustration. Uh, do you think improvements are being made, and, um, and do you think that they're being made quickly enough? Well, the vacuum tubes are gone, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but um, I've pretty much concluded that air traffic control is, um, is an evolutionary process. Um, and given the complexity of uh, air travel and the paramount concern of safety, um, I think it's probably wise that it be evolutionary. But to me, evolutionary doesn't mean eons. <laughs> uh, it means um, efficient use of time and resources to make things happen. Uh, I don't think it should take 15 years to install GPS um, and a lot of other things. Um, I will say that I am convinced that as long as the FAA and air traffic control are subject to the daily whims of congressional committees and jurisdictional fights, um, that air traffic control is going to be a very slow, painfully slow process of progress. Uh, I do have some ideas uh, about how I think things should go, but right now the big problem is, well, the FAA's authority was uh, expired in 2007. I think there have been 22 extensions yep. of the program, uh, meaning level, level conditions, level funding, uh, without investing the kind of capital and resources that are required to improve um, on an expeditious basis uh, air traffic control safety. So I think until uh, there's some substantive fundamental changes uh, made in the way Congress uh, and the FAA interact with each other, I think we're going to continue to have air traffic control problems. Well, probably in a lot of ways the FAA shutdown of last month brought that, uh, brought that home to people in a very vivid way. Yeah, but you know, the stories were all focused on people who were laid off from their work. Um, there was very little focus um, on what that meant, to what extent did it have an impact on the safety and security of the system, um, or uh, the operational efficiency of the system. So, you know, the, the media focus is generally on whether a plane falls out of the sky, or whether thousands of people are laid off from their jobs. Um, I guess looking at the infrastructure of the system is perhaps not as an attractive subject uh, for the media. Besides, you have to explain it. You say 74,000 people were off, off their jobs because Congress couldn't find the money. People understand that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if you say the planes did not fall out of the sky, people understand that. But when you start looking beyond that, at the operational side of air traffic control, it's too complicated for people to understand. It's it takes too much space in the newspaper or on television to tell the story. And so that part of it doesn't get explained, and yet it's an important part for the public to understand. Well, I think uh, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next segment. Okay. It's a good jumping off point.